Welcome everyone to the Eternal Vitality Podcast. My name is Dr. Jesse Morse and I am the host and founder of this podcast. I am a sports and family medicine board certified physician in Miami, Florida, and we have several different locations. I'm predominantly in Miami as well as Jacksonville. We also have Jupiter, Florida and Knoxville. We try to approach medicine a little differently at, at the clinic I'm at. And, and, and one of the reasons is because I feel like medicine has kind of gotten away from us. It, it's become very monotonous. Um, it's, it's really subdivided. And as a result, it's leading to poorer health care, um, a lot more money being spent, and you're really not getting the results you're looking for. We've covered a ton of different topics so far in this journey. This is episode number 17. And today we will talk about the best ways to improve healing without injections or surgery. Now, I specialize in sports medicine or what I consider non-surgical orthopedics. Now, for you that may translate to a knee injury or a shoulder injury or a wrist sprain or an ankle sprain or back pain, and, and unfortunately, not everyone wants to go injections, which is my specialty, or surgery, which you know most people never want to undergo. Sometimes it's required and necessary, and other times it's an option. It may not be the best option for that patient. Now, the issue with traditional medicine and, and traditional sports medicine and orthopedics is it is a poorly scripted cycle. So you go see an orthopedist, as long as it's not a fracture, then you have options of physical therapy, maybe a cortisone injection. And then they kind of tell you, hey, if it's not getting better, you know, more physical therapy, more injections, or maybe surgery. They don't really like to talk about this whole field of regenerative medicine, which is using either your body, uh, you know, whether it's blood or, or bone marrow or, or, or fat, or, you know, a donor's body to optimize your healing and get you back to feeling, you know, significantly better, maybe close to 100%, uh, improve your pain, improve uh, quality of life, reduce uh, the burden of this injury impacting you, and ideally prevent the progression of that injury, ideally also preventing uh, surgery or for that injury from coming back and whatnot. So it's it's because it's not financially lucrative for big pharma and for big insurance that's not something that they push and as a result it's not taught and that makes it even more challenging to infiltrate the american healthcare system from a residency and and uh, you know early physician perspective because they're not taught it and when they're not taught it, they're not going to utilize it. We, we basically just replicate what we do as a physician the majority of our life, adding in some new protocols and maybe some new medications, uh, and, and not a whole lot changes. That's why I chose to get out of traditional healthcare because I, I felt like I was a rat on a treadmill and they're like, oh, you need to see, you're seeing 20 patients today, you need to see 25 or 30. I'm like, do you understand how difficult it is to, to help listen, figure out exactly what's wrong to 25 to 30 patients a day. And also give yourself time to write the notes that said uh, patient uh, is going to get so it gets covered by insurance. And also to eat. It's it's like not possible. It's, it, it's, it's just a lot of fluff, a lot of garbage. And you really don't have time with the patient because you, you can't it's not possible. And that's what the systems become. I, you know, I, I when I used to do family medicine before I, I specialized uh, into f- sports medicine, I would take care of you know your diabetes, your blood pressure, your heart disease, whatever it was. And 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 gone are the days that a traditional doc is going to handle a lot of that because now everything's subspecialized. Oh, you have a diabetes, uh, you know, a thyroid problem. I'm going to send you to endocrinology. You have, uh, you know, high blood pressure and a cholesterol issue. I'm going to send you to cardiology or you have something wrong with your gut. Oh, I'm going to send you to GI. And now you have four five, six, seven different doctors that you have to juggle. And the problem is none of those doctors are communicating. So you have this massive issue of just poor communication and who suffers at the end of the day? The patient. 
the insurance companies want to continue to delay. No, we're going to give it a couple more weeks. No, we're going to deny that prior authorization. No, we, we, we're not going to allow that MRI. Why? Because they're collecting more premiums from you. So the longer they delay, either you're going to give up or they're going to collect more money and eventually it will be financially lucrative for them to say yes because you've jumped through hoops to get there. To my knowledge, there's no protocol that says you need six weeks of physical therapy before you can get a, a, an MRI covered. That's some crock that insurance made up to justify not paying three, four, five hundred dollars for that MRI. And, and, and that, that's the problem is that some of the things may improve with, with physical therapy um, and with conservative care. But what if you just made that injury worse by pushing it on a mild and now it's moderate? Now it becomes, now you have to hit it harder or now you need surgery where maybe you didn't previously. So, you know, the system is broken and I'm doing my part to try to share information to help you optimize and, and to try to live a longer, healthier life for you and your loved ones, whether you are a patient or a provider or both. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the primary goal here for this specific uh, podcast is to optimize uh, ways to improve your healing Um a little bit more specific, uh, whether you have back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, hip pain, whatever it is, you're going to have something eventually that's going to bother you. That's not going to allow you to play that activity, to, to, to sleep in that manner that you want to, to say, nope, I don't want to do that activity because I'm afraid of X pain. That pain can be crippling. It can be, can deter you from, from living the life that you want to live. And, 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 and one of the goals for my patients is uh, whether injections or not, is to allow them to get back to the, 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 the life and the quality of life that they want. They have less pain or zero, ideally no pain. They have much more function. They have more range of motion. They have uh, an, an ability to really do whatever they want. If they want to go rock climbing, then they should be able to go rock climbing. Like I'm not going to tell my patient no. I, you know, a lot of doctors might, but it may not be in their best interest to do that. And I'll, I'll, I'll advise them, you know, this in this activity for you, probably not in your best interest. But if you want to do this, by all means, you know, one of the, the hardest things I learned in, in, in my fellowship was telling a runner not to run. They're not going to listen to you. That's their form of de-stressing, their form of of you know, enjoying, that's what they love to do. So if you're telling them, don't do that, it, you're, they're not going to listen to you because that's what makes them normal. It, you might, you might be successful temporarily, but eventually that's, what's going to allow them to, to function again. So you have to figure out how to make them better so that they can actually do the activity they love. And, and so today we're going to talk about a couple different things that can do that, that you can do at home or, 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 or with with the help of a of, of a provider in your in your home in in your place of residence whether it's in a city whether it's in a small town whether you're in you know Australia wherever you may be hopefully these some of these things are uh, are helpful to you whether or not you know about them so uh, you know I spend my days evaluating orthopedic injuries. Sometimes they're minor and, and physical therapy and, and small changes will be enough. Great. But sometimes they're moderate and that decision is tougher. Whether it's regenerative medicine, surgery, or just living with it. Unfortunately, that is always an option. It might not be a good option, but it's an option. And then you have the severe cases that surgery or a lot of orthobiologics are required. And, and then sometimes you're not going to get to zero pain. You're not going to get to full functionality. That's unrealistic. And you have to understand what's realistic and what's unrealistic. And I think uh, it's the, the goal of the provider to do that. If they're not realistically telling you, hey, after this surgery, after this procedure, when you were you know, fully uh, set free and re ready to go, this is what you can and can't do. If they're not doing that and you come out with one assumption and they're coming out with another, you need to get on the same page because maybe they might not want to do that procedure or that surgery if it wasn't for 
the information that you failed to, to provide to them. So as a patient, ask better questions. As a provider, be more complete. What can and can't they do if they choose this service? If they want to do X and the and, and the treatment recommendation you're offering doesn't allow them to do X, then it's not a good treatment for them. You know, the goal of my patients when I see them is to provide them with as much information as I can, more information than they came with. I want to provide the both non-surgical and the surgical uh, possibilities. I'm not a surgeon. I can't perform the surgery, but if it's in my patient's best interest to have surgery, then I'm going to give them the risks and, and the benefits of that surgery to the best of my knowledge. And that may be more information than that surgeon's willing to do. You know, if I say, Hey, I can get, bring you up to X, Y, Z with an injection, but if you want this, unfortunately you have to have surgery and I'm okay with that. But, but the patient needs to understand what what's available. What, what, what are we dealing with here? And, and, and that's the problem with, with medicine, in my opinion, always, is there's lack of communication. Everything is rushed. The ancillary staff, your MAs, your nurses, your, uh, some of the mid-levels, they don't have the same training and the same expertise. They don't have the same number of hours with patients. That's part of the physician training. The, and, and so as a physician, we, that's part of our responsibility is to educate the patient. And if you don't, that's on new, you, not on the patient. So here's some tools that can help you optimize, uh, treat, treating the pain, optimize the healing and help you return to as close to normal function as possible. Now, some of these are traditional and some of these are not, and that's okay. Some of these may be covered by insurance and, and some of them may not be. Just because they're not covered by insurance doesn't mean they don't work. That just means they don't want to pay for them. That's the difference. Take control of your life, your health. 20, 30 years down the road, back, like, well, I didn't do it because insurance didn't cover it. Well, if you can't afford it, I get that opinion. But if you can afford it, you just said, hey, I didn't want to spend the money. What's more important than health? You can have all the money in the world, but if you're too sick uh, to... To, to utilize that money, then what good is it? You know, that's what I think about all the time. It's like, you know, this patient has all this money, but they have this disease they can't do anything about. Well, what good is the money? They're miserable. They can't do anything with it. W would you trade some of that money to prevent said disease? I promise you almost all of them would say, no question. So think about it that way. Be proactive, not just reactive with your health. It's easy to be reactive. Oh, I see this. I'm going to do something about it. Be proactive to prevent this. We know our, our environment is filled with toxins and garbage that they didn't really like to talk about the past 20 years. That has led to where we are now. They finally said, oh, tobacco is bad for us. How, you know, how, how many years do we know that before they actually were willing to admit it? Unfortunately, the powers that be, there's a lot of backroom dealings going on, a lot of money being shared, lobbying. It says, even though we know this isn't good for you, we're not going to say that because our, our pockets are getting greased. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, who suffers? We do. Because we're, we're being told one thing when it's actually not the case. And, and, and we saw that with COVID. We saw that with the vaccines. We're, we're seeing this with with these all these GMO products and modified, all these pesticide-filled foods. And it's going to be too late for our generation to, 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 to modify that because it's so ingrained in who we are, specifically in America. So the first uh, thing that, that, that I really want to focus on is physical therapy. Sometimes you need to go back to the basics. And unfortunately, I think physical therapy has got a bad rap. And, and a lot of it has to do with, with, with the money that is affiliated with it. When, you, when you're a physical therapist, you have a choice. You can work for insurance companies and take their patients, or you can work independently. The easy, quote unquote, easy and less challenging op option is, is to work for, for a, a, a organization that that takes insurance that your patients just get hand delivered to you. But the problem is 
you have very limited time with them, and you really have to see four or five patients at a time, basically an hour, to keep the doors open. Because they're only going to pay you about 30 maybe $35 per, per, per hour if you're lucky. So you can't function on that. You can't keep a business open on that. So you need to see four or five patients an hour. Or you start handing those patients to less skilled therapists. And, and who ends up losing at the end of the day? The patient. They end up having to go to 10 visits as opposed to five because they're, they're not really making a whole lot of progress. So for my patients, I prefer physical therapists that are one-on-one -on -one with them, just you and them for an hour or 50 minutes or whatever the time frame is. But you are going to get a lot more work, a lot more progress with that hour. Anybody who's, who's been to physical therapy and was just on a hand bike or doing something, uh, you know, rudimentary, they usually get a, a, you know, kind of a bad impression of physical therapy and like, oh no, it's a waste of my time. If you've been with a good physical therapist, it's like torture. It, 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 a lot of the times you have to recreate pain to address some of the problems to get forward. You go backwards to go forwards. So, you know, it may not be fun. Anybody who says, oh, physical therapy is easy. Not, not if you're doing it right. Not at the beginning. Not if the injury is legitimate. You know, not if they're doing their job correctly. But unfortunately, a, a lot of these good physical therapists are not in the system because they'll never be able to keep the doors open. They won't make enough money to, to, to survive if they're depending on insurance companies because you can't see one patient an hour on an insurance-based salary. You just you won't be able to do it, especially if you live in a city. So a lot of the times you have to find the ones that are, that are high level. Most of them are, are DPTs or doctors of physical therapy now. They, uh, I, I prefer the ones that are very hands-on, especially for uh, orthopedic injuries, uh, namely, you know, uh, something called Graston, which is a, a metal spoon that kind of helps to get out some of the scar tissue. You can do uh, what they call flossing, which helps the lower extremity injuries. You can do uh, dry needling, which if they know what they're doing is, is very effective, it can be a little risky in certain parts of the body. You can do cupping, which you probably remember Michael Phelps doing way back when. And then there's something called blood flow restriction, which is really effective. It's essentially almost using a blood pressure cuff to uh, decrease the blood flow to the injured tissue, uh, working out at a lower level. Uh, one rep max, and then releasing that blood pressure cuff and allowing all that healthy blood to rush into the tissue and help to heal it. Old school uh, Japanese term called katsu that were developed. Well, oftentimes you get less appointments because you make a lot more progress. And, 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 and you know, my, when I tell the, the, the patients, this is what I'm going to tell the therapist. I tell them exactly what I want them to do, but I also share the injury, what I did, what I recommended, and I let them work their magic. Do what they do. This is what, you know, you're going to see them a lot more than you're going to see me. Let them work their magic. If they have a question, they'll reach out. You know, I say address the compensation patterns first. F fix what you developed after you developed this injury. If you, if you were initially going this way and you can't do that anymore because it hurts and you started going this way. Well, your body is not going to naturally go, oh, I'm going to do this this way because this is how I'm supposed to do it. No. This is what you have to retrain your body to do. In my head, it's almost like if you're driving in the middle lane of a highway and then you suffer an injury. We'll say it's a, a, a flat tire or something. And you start drifting to the right-hand lane. The problem is your body's not going to naturally go back into the center lane you, that therapist has to help get you in that center lane. And sometimes the ligaments and tendons that are injured are so beat up and po uh, poor, you know, torn, weak, that they can't keep you in the center lane. And then you start drifting back to the right. So that's sometimes when you need that therapy or when you need that injection or you need that surgery to, uh, it, to improve that strength to allow you to stay in that center lane. Once you've addressed those compensation patterns, then you can finally evolve to muscle balancing, making sure the left is equivalent to the right, 
the medial inside part is equivalent to the lateral part. So you don't have an imbalance. Imbalance causes a lot of problems. I see it in the, in, in the rotator cuff. I see it in the knee all the time. You will have imbalances, which is what always leads to uh, injuries over time. If, 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 if it's supposed to be like this and you start doing like this, well, this part of the knee is going to get arthritis or wear down of cartilage a lot faster than if it was perfectly square. Now, it may not happen in a day or two or a week or two, but over time, you will start to create new injuries because of that imbalance of tissue. If they're balanced, everything works beautifully. It's like an orchestra that is perfectly tuned. Now, um, if you can't, if people, patients always ask me, when, when do I get cleared for, for to, to return to play, to return to activity, whatever you want to call it, when you can do it in front of the therapist. If you can't do it in front of the therapist with perfect form, you shouldn't be doing it on your own because you, you still have work to do. When, when does someone get cleared? I have rough guidelines, but everyone heals at a different rate. How much work are you willing to put in? Are you going to do your quote unquote homework that the therapist gives you? All of these are variables into saying, when am I going to return? There's a lot of things that are that involved in that. That's a, 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 almost a contract between you and the therapist. And if you're not willing to, to put in the time, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. And you may always have that injury. You may band-aid it a little bit, but you'll never get to the root of the problem because you didn't get to the root of the problem. All right. Hopefully that was helpful. That was the first thing that we can do to optimize healing without injections or surgery. Physical therapy, when done correctly, is very good at what they do. It, it's going to be worth the financial uh, recommendation to, 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 to go out of network if you have the luxury to be able to afford it. Or if you don't, then you really need to hold them accountable. Okay, the next one that I love to use all the time, I personally take it every day, is vitamin C. Vitamin C is the most studied drug ever. I mean ever. Tens of thousands of papers. And, and, and it is amazing for pain reduction, for reducing inflammation, for building collagen, which we'll talk about more in a sec. Orally, I actually prefer, prefer sodium ascorbate version, which is a basic versus uh, ascorbic acid, which is uh, obviously acidic. I, I, if you can get in about four grams uh, a, a day, that would be ideal. Most of us, I personally believe, are living in sub-therapeutic scurvy or low vitamin C levels. Most people do not get enough they're looking for. If I remember correctly, we only absorb about 28 to 31% of the vitamin C that we eat in our diet. We get awful low amounts and our guts are all jacked up due to these pesticides, glyphosate, and all these different things that are causing inflammation, messing with the, 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 the barrier junctions in our gut and causing what I call SIBO or a small bacterial overgrowth. Now back to vitamin C. I prefer when my patients get an injection, if you're going to do it, do it right the first time. So uh, for, for, for them, I say, hey, we have two options. You have the injection by itself or you have what I call the optimal healing package. Now that involves multiple levels of IVs, uh, some supplements that I provide to you and different modalities after and I'll talk about some of those today. Now, I, I've realized that just doing a single injection or a combination of injections and then letting the patient figure it out on their own doesn't always work. Do it completely. Prep the tissue, help the rest of the body, help the tissue with a, the help of a physical therapist, optimize the body with different resources that we have that know uh, help to improve the quality of the tissue and healing they are going to get a much better result when you do that. Vitamin C should be part of that protocol. Why? Because ligaments and tendons, which are the majority of our injuries in our, in our tissues for a musculoskeletal or orthopedic injury, are made up of collagen. The most important molecule that makes up collagen is vitamin C. 
So if you flood the system with vitamin C, your body's going to be really happy. I personally have patients do 50 grams IV after an injection if they're willing to, assuming they have a negative G6PD level and they've eaten something that day. You can do it before. You can do it after. You can do it on the next day, kind of whenever you want. Very effective. As I mentioned, I prefer the basic version. I per, I, I use a, a brand called Pure C, uh, but there are many different brands. A lot of people use the old school classic version, sodium uh, ascorbic acid. Unfortunately, that has a little bit more side effects uh, from a IV perspective than does the uh, sodium ascorbate. It has to do with the pH of it. The next optimal healing thing that I've loved for many years now, and I continue to take it religiously, is curcumin. Now, you're probably wondering, what the heck is curcumin? Have you ever heard of the root or the spice turmeric? Well, the most potent part of turmeric is curcumin. The problem is it's only about 3% of the root. So instead of eating turmeric and hoping to get all the beautiful benefits only in 3% of that, why don't you take out and isolate the most potent part, curcumin, and understand that that is one of the world's most natural and potent anti-inflammatories. Super potent. It can be filled with a little bit of garbage, so you have to know products and you have to know where it's being farmed and get. Uh, most of the quality products seem to be from North India. That's where it's natural. Now, um, I have a, a colleague that has a, a master's or has a doctorate really in, in curcumin, and, and, the, and the thesis was in, 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 in turmeric and in, in, in curcumin. So they realized that there are three curcuminoids, but there's only one that are that is active. The other two are inactive. So if you're taking all three, you're kind of losing the potency of the other two, and you're diminishing because you're not getting as much as you could of the potent one. That potent one is called C3. So if you Google curcumin C3, you're going to see a lot of products because that's the most potent form. Now, the cool thing about curcumin is that it is ridiculously strong and super safe. That's why I love to use it with my patients, especially with patients after an inflammatory procedure like PRP or, or you know bone marrow or adipose, where they don't have the luxury of ibuprofen or relief because that's going to be counterproductive for that injection. You want to continue that inflammation for a couple of days, and if you take an anti-inflammatory, you're going to lose some of that beautiful inflammation. Well, the cool thing is that curcumin doesn't have that same negative effect. So they can get a benefit of a healing response without being counterproductive to that injection. Now, if you look at some of the brands and stuff, there's, you know, there, there's a lot of a fluff and garbage out there. I use a company uh, that evaluates all these and kind of says, hey, this is the doses that's actually in the bottle or in, in the capsule. This is all the different, uh, you know, things that was screened for. This one had, you know, E. coli. This one has a heavy metal. And it basically tells you which ones are legitimate. So the most recent recommendation, I don't have any ties to the company, but this is what I use, is a company called Vitacost, V-I-T-A-C-O-S-T. Um, I, I, buy, I buy it on Amazon. Uh, and you could realistically take probably, uh, you know, the, the recommendations show up to three milligrams per day uh, per um, kilogram of body weight, which is about a half to a full mo milligram uh, per pound. Uh, you know, I, I probably take on the higher side of that, and I wouldn't be surprised if you can do a lot more than that, but that's what the data shows. Um, and the cool thing is it's not going to affect your liver. It's not going to affect your kidneys. It's not going to cause any issues with the negative inflammation, and it helps with so many different parts of your body. I don't know if it's technically classified as a superfood, but it is in my opinion. So curcumin should be a staple in your diet, in your uh, supplement list to help with inflammation and help with so many different things in your body. Okay, <clears throat> those are the two oral things that you can take every day that can help with healing, help with pain, and also help with uh, overall health.
The last two we're going to talk about are different modalities that you may have heard of. You've definitely heard of the first one. You may or may not have heard of the second one. The first one is red light therapy. Now, what is all the rage with red light? So red light is absorbed through the skin and it actually helps to increase collagen production. There's something called near infrared, which actually penetrates a little deeper, helps with muscle recovery and reducing joint pain. Now, there are several, there are, you know, many, many different benefits to red light, but I'll, I'll summarize some of them here. Improves collagen production, which is fantastic for healing because collagen makes up our face, makes up our skin, makes up our joints, makes up our tissue. It's everywhere. It's super important in the body. So uh, if you have the luxury of being able to heal and repair this, do it. Reduces cellulite in from, uh, formation. Okay, cool. Great benefits from red light in the skin. They have red light masks. They have red light beds. They, I wear a, a red light watch that helps to decrease the uh, inflammation and, and a lot of the issues in the blood vessels. Uh, and then it circulates throughout the body. So there's many different things. Uh, it helps to promote wound healing and tissue repair. Uh, red light actually helps to support hair growth. So you've probably may have seen those capsules that have the little probes in them that uh, have red light and it will stimulate the hair follicle to grow. Um, so obviously you need the, you know, the more potency you're going to get more of effect. Some of the cheap ones are, are, are going to be, you know, less effective, but there is a, a, a truth to the fact that red light does help hair growth. It also helps circadian rhythm and deep sleep, which is vital for healing. And finally, helps to stimulate the mitochondrial health, which is vital. Everything runs by mitochondria. If, you're, if your mitochondria aren't functioning, you're going to be really hurting and you're not going to be detoxing. You're, and you're eventually, this is going to lead to your demise. So overall, clinically proven to help skin, help muscle recovery, help body contouring, mental clarity, athletic performance, joint pain, sexual performance, and even sleep. Red light therapy should be a staple in your healing protocol, we have a super potent one at the office called a biophoton or a firefly that works really strong. You don't need to get one that strong, um, but uh, there are many different levels. I wouldn't be surprised if some people have a you know, almost like a like a like a sleeping bag that has red light inside of it. And there are some companies that actually make this mixed with other modalities. And one of the other modalities that's mixed with is called PEMS or stands for pulsed electromagnetic fields. Now, these have been around for a long time, 1970s, probably even before that. And, and these provide energy at the cellular level without being invasive. Yeah, they come in different forms. You can see it as a mat. You can see it as like a... Um, a little electro, uh, almost like a little probe. I have a coil that I slide over the arm, uh, a little a thing, kind of a little mat that you can put your hand on or put on your neck. I do this for post-op for a lot of my injection patients. This is part of my post-op protocol. And the first time I was actually introduced to this, maybe five or six years ago, um, is, is in high level horse racing where any of the horses would have injuries. They would use this PEMF to help heal the tissue faster. This is actually a bone stimulator. So it'll help heal fractures faster than if you didn't use it. It actually has the ability to enhance the body's natural healing processes and it assists with muscle recovery and, and, and post exercise discomfort. Um, it will actually do something similar to grounding, if you've ever heard of that before, which basically means that you're getting some of the energy uh, back from the Earth's surface. So walking on grass or sand or anything like that will do. Uh, will have similar benefits. Um, it, it helps with PMF helps with cellular energy production um, and improves circulation and oxygenation. And can help with detoxification, which is vital. Most of the problems is detoxify the body it doesn't have the ability to, to remove the toxins, and as a result, struggles. It can help also help with sleep quality. Can reduce pain and inflammation. Can also improve the immune system, mood, and cognition. So, pretty cool. 10, 15, 20 minutes a day if you have the luxury of being able to do it. Obviously, would not have any electronics around it because it is magnetic. Um, 
the we have one in the office that is super strong. You don't have to get one that strong, but uh, it does have the ability to really help optimize healing without being painful or uncomfortable. Ours at the office, and most of them uh, likely have almost like a volume knob, so you you kind of turn it up, and and, and it, you get to a point where it's either good or it's uncomfortable and then you probably turn it down a little bit what i noticed is that it has a tendency to target areas that are are injured and not doing well that the one we have that's kind of what it does and we have a really strong one and and from my understanding it helps uh, address the polarity of the tissue tissues have different polarities or, or positive and negative charges and, and it has a tendency to find the tissues that are not healthy because of their polarity. Um, and, and it helps to remove some of the tissue uh, tissues that are causing the inflammation and swelling and almost recruits tissues that are going to help with the healing. So pretty cool just from a magnet. Now, those are just some of the things that I wanted to talk about today. I don't want to make this too long, uh, but I also wanted to show you that there are cool things you you can do, that you can eat, that you can partake in, that can optimize your healing that professional athletes use every day that um, may not be part of your traditional protocol, but aren't completely crazy to say, hey, just because uh, I don't know about it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, doesn't mean it doesn't work. So these are things that you can happily incorporate into your um, into your diet, into your lifestyle, into your healing protocol to help you optimize your healing. I hope you liked this episode. If you haven't seen some of my other episodes, I recommend you checking them out, uh, spreading the word. If you haven't uh, had a chance to uh, leave me a review on any of the places you can leave a review, Spotify, Apple, uh, you know, YouTube. Uh, I would appreciate it. And we have more content coming out each week. Thank you for tuning in. Take care.